And our second speaker is Tara Van Amarongen, Group Director at Ford. She leads a multidisciplinary team designing experiences, services and products to complement and extend the human experience. She's described her role as getting people excited about design as much as she is and then getting out of their way. She's such a wealth of knowledge on what the future looks like and how we fit into it. So please join me in welcoming her to the stage. All right, I'm just using the phone for a timer so I don't, uh, I don't go on. So um, my name's Tara van Amerongen. Um, it's a Dutch name. Uh, I'm Canadian, born and bred, and I went to the Netherlands for about six years uh, doing strategy consulting work um, before I came to Australia for just a year in 2010. Um, and I found myself in a position where I decided that design was for me from an ethical standpoint. So I think it's important to always talk about why you design, so you know a little bit about me and you care a little bit about me, so you care about what I'm about to say. Um, so I found myself uh, working on programs of work that were going to go up for funding. So programs of work at a big major bank that cost above $10 million. And how a bank makes their money is they charge fees to moms and dads, to people who don't earn a lot, and that's the way they earn their revenue. And I had this program of work come across my desk that was all about retirees and how retirees were going to do their financial planning via an app. Now, I don't know about your grandma, but my grandma sure as hell isn't going to do financial planning from an app. And they were going to spend you know, tens of millions of dollars on this program of work. And I thought, all right. I need to stop this. I need to kill this project because I actually don't feel right about, you know, this is the way we spend our investors' money. And you know what? I couldn't kill the project. There was no way I could stop it. It was some general manager's pet project. There was no way in the business case to say that this isn't what users wanted. I had no way to say no one's going to use this thing. Little did I know, I was flagged on an HR list to go into design thinking training. And literally two lessons in, I was like, this is it. The penny has dropped. This is what I have to do. Because this is a tool set, a proper, credible tool set to really represent what people need to hear, what users actually want. And to be honest, how will a corporate executive know what a mom and dad need, or a retiree, or someone who's 65 who's from a very different demographic, um, you know, and a very different level of affluence than they are. So from that moment, I was hooked. And for the last five years, I've been doing design. Um, I started at the ComBank Innovation Lab, went to BCG Digital Ventures, and now uh, went from Fjord to Delivery Directory into uh, caretaking, what I say is caretaking the, the designers. Um, not a leader, but making sure they're supported in what they, in they do. So today I'm going to talk about data and design a little bit. Now, it's an emerging field. Um, as Matt pointed out, even the definition of what this is is something that we're playing with. And that makes sense for any new field. So each of us presenters are going to kind of layer up the information as we go. Now, I'm from a business background, so I'm going to talk about what I see from corporates, from what businesses are telling me, and how we sort of position data and design back to them. So they tell us they're overwhelmed, that the, the things are moving so quickly for them. They go through these large transformation projects. They invest in things, and by the time it's implemented and all the dust is settled, the world has changed. And the things that made them successful previously no longer apply. So they come to us in a bit of a panic, saying, how do we become relevant again? And we know as well now that it's, we've, we've had this huge inflection point with technology where it's faster to build than to plan. So things are going so quickly that the second you have something brand new, it becomes old again. And because this pace is moving forward, they actually can't keep up. Um, some old school examples, if you think of Star Wars or Knight Rider, for anyone who's above 30 in the audience, those things that we thought were impossible are possible today. And maybe for the younger audience, think of the 2013 film Her, where the character of Joaquin Phoenix fell in love with this operating system. Now, I know a few people who do use Alexa, and they're in love with it. So even that's come true today. So technology is changing constantly over and over again. But what they also tell me is, those expectations that we have from a digital perspective and from design and experience, 
the new workforce also expects that. You're looking at the interactions you have on a day-to-day -day basis from a, a retail consumer perspective, and then you go into the workplace and you're exposed to these systems where you have to do timesheets and book annual leave, and you know, you're know you going through these really clunky systems as well. And your expectations are very different because you know that it's possible to have a much better experience. So it's no longer enough for a company to be an efficient machine. They have to have attributes we can connect with almost on a human level. And we call at Fjord this liquid expectations, where what we, what we have in, as a company is your competitors are no longer, say, if you are a bank, other banks. We call them experiential competitors, which means when you have a great experience on Uber Eats or Airbnb or Amazon or Google now, that is the new bar for what good looks like for you. And the second that that is, you know, through, through everyone, everyone's experience, you know, that needs to be improved again and again and again. So what we say is the expectations people have are not just from your product or service or from your sector, they're from what we're seeing globally from an experience perspective. And therefore, we call it liquid expectations. They're changing each and every day. Things are moving so quickly physically, but also figuratively. So you have to be keeping up with what those expectations are. So some companies are just trying to capture lots of data. And they know that it's the new gold, but they're not sure really what to do with it yet. And you yourself know you probably feel a little bit uncomfortable with how much data people have collected on you. You know that you've just sort of relinquished Google and Facebook and these companies, they have your data. But to be honest, they're not using it very effectively. Um, a piece of thought leadership that comes out of Accenture, which is uh, sort of our mothership that's taken over Fjord, they say that nine out of 10 companies, particularly CIOs, they've invested in this to capture all this information, but are they using it and turning it around for positive benefit for, for the customers? And also, is it hitting their bottom line? And the answer is, is no. So what they're trying to do is sometimes just come up with a new product, a new service, a new department. They're trying to come up with a new way to address this. How can they create a new offering? Now, the needs you have each and every day, if we talk about core human needs for security, for comfort, for connection, those haven't been in there. Uh, those have always been there, and they will be. And also, your need for takeaway, for a new pair of jeans, for a bank account, those things haven't changed either. But the way you want those products and services offered to you is changing. And that's where your expectations are very different. So personalization is really important. It's no longer about brand loyalty. It's about them having customer loyalty for us. And anyone here who, for example, has called a telco and had to repeat five times over why you're there and tell your story about why you called as you get passed from department to department to department knows how frustrating that can be when you say, they know every text message I've sent, they know all my browsing history on my phone, yet the second I interact with them, that personalization is completely lost. And I think rightly so, we get frustrated with that lack of personalization. They take the data, but they're not actually turning it around for us constructively. And the next one is context. So while machine learning and AI and data science have some very, very sophisticated models, we still need a design thinking approach to find out what do people want in context? What are their actual needs in that particular moment? And that's why we see also a lot of our designers moving to jobs to be done, the modes that we're in. So for example, if I'm shopping at Woolies for a dinner party on a Saturday afternoon, I'm in a very different mode than if it's 7 a.m. and I need to get some baby formula before my kid wakes up. <laughs> Those are two very different, different modes. What are the jobs to be done for people? And what does context look like for me? And how do I want features or pathways of a product to adapt up and down depending on the mode that I'm in? So we call this living services. So two things. We offer living services, living being that it adapts, and it grows, and it changes. So a service that actually sort of wraps around you, and it learns from you, and it's able to change and move along as things move with you. As the ground shifts beneath our feet, a product doesn't stay static, but it's actually able to learn, adapt, change with you. And I'll talk a bit more about what that, what that looks like. And why we say services and not, and not product is that that entire engagement journey from learning about a product, communicating with a company, you know, uh, reading the copy on the website, the tone of voice and an interaction, 
all the touch points you have with them using the product and how you feel about that product later, that end-to-end -end experience is what we call servicing. Um, so it may not just be using your phone, but when you pay your bill, when someone asks you how you like the service, how you see it advertised at a bus stop, all of that is, is part of the service. So we say they're uh, personalized, they respond in real time, and there's five components that make up what we call living services. Um, and we'll talk about how data and design are both absolutely required to provide these to the market. So the first one is the North Star. Now you always have when you create a, you go to do a new project for a company, what is that North Star vision? What are you trying to achieve? But also here, you want to think about how are you going to have a relationship with your customer or the user? How are you going to have tone of voice? How are you going to interact with them? How do they want to, uh, to have that relationship with you? The next one is what we call a rule book. So these are those predetermined decisions about um, how will you go from one pathway to another? How will the service be offered? Um, what are the, the moments where the service will be turned off, turned on, or switching from, from one pathway to another? And this also lets you know how will that service actually um, navigate through an organization internally. The rule book might say if someone has a question about billing, it goes to this department. Or they might say their plan is not big enough, it goes to another department. So how are you going to interact internally? The next one is triggers. So if you think about the customer engagement lifestyle cycle, there are triggers about when someone recognizes they have a need, when they start doing some comparison about the different ways to fulfill that need, when they might actually contact a company because they've chosen that company to go with, and then so forth, choosing a product, using it, et cetera, et cetera. So those triggers can be at any moment, a moment of that life cycle, and it's for you to determine when that trigger is observed by the company, what do you do then? So you need to understand what those triggers could potentially be. The next one is micro moments. So these are the parts where you have those interactions where you use what you know about a customer or a user, um, and then you're able to provide that service experience. And the last one, this is my favorite one because it really challenges companies on how they're structured and how you think about brand experience. We call it atomized profile. Uh, if you think about the way you have services, can you actually compartmentalize them and you can offer them in combination with services or data sharing from other companies? Great example is if you say, Alexa, I need new batteries. Um, Alexa will actually go and order you Duracell or Energizer and have it shipped by DHL or Amazon Prime or Australia Post and it comes to you but that service is offered through Alexa and it's calling and recalling other services. So you've got the core service and then you're able to interact with other companies in order to fulfill that need. Now what this does is it challenges how organization is structured, but it really challenges brand experience. Is that now the brand of Duracell or the shipping company or Alexa? What does that look like? But what it's still doing for you is fulfilling a need you have. So we talked about this to say, how are you going to do this for services, but also for data? So how are you going to information share with partners? And a really good example that was already mentioned was Facebook. You know, how do you use Facebook to authenticate someone? That's already a data partnership that exists. Um, so to have a living service, you may only offer a few components of a service, but the question is, to provide that full experience, who do you want to partner with? How are you going to have almost digital plugs and sockets to use other, other companies that are out there? So how it all works together. Um, I might use an example of, say, Google Now um, to describe how this works. So you've got a trigger and a rule book about how are you going to uh, have a customer engage with you. So today we say there are expected micro moments. You might log into, say, a website. They might know a little bit about you. You expect them, you know, once you log in, it to say, hello, Tara, with you know, a little icon in the top corner. It might have my credit card details, my address. It might know I'm a female. So it shows you know, a female products there. Um, and they're using the data they have, hopefully, to serve me. What we want to do is we want to take it those next levels where we're recalling other information that's out there and we're providing other services to create those magical experiences. So say with Google. Google knows today, it gives me uh, on Google now, say I'm at a pub in central London, it might say, Tara, traffic is heavy. You need to, uh, you have an appointment to meet up with your two friends at this pub. You know, if you leave now, you'll, you'll be there on time. Cool. So the next 
level of that experience might be, if I started walking, it might say, Tara, you're walking too fast. By the time you get there, that pub won't be open yet. So it's actually gone there, recall the information of that pub to know their openings time, and it's provided me sort of that next level experience. It's gone out and got extra data and provide that, provided that to me. Now, if it was to be even better, what it would do is say, hey, Tara, you're going to that pub. It's closed. It looks like in your calendar you have an appointment with two other people. How would I look up a comparable pub that also offers German craft beer in the same area, and I send a text message to those people to meet at this other location instead? Now, that's a magical experience. They have the information to do that, or they can go out and publicly get that information and then create a really great experience for me. So what we're seeing is you have to start interacting with more and more data sets to provide that experience for people to understand context, what's relevant, and have those feedback loops for, for people. Now, we'll talk a bit later about is that helpful or creepy? I'm sure that debate will come up a bit later. Um, but what we would look to see is with companies, do you want to provide these extra layers of experience by getting more data involved in the servicing loop? So it's going away from reports and analytics and just pushing out what we know in terms of data, and it's more about pull and creating insights that are actually actionable. And designers are really, really good at finding out what people actually care about, and data scientists are really good about just showing what they have. And somewhere we need to come together and say, what information's helpful? What information's relevant? What information is going to actually change how, how we have insights uh, of people? Now, when I talk to my team about data and design, I get this, uh, this feeling from them, but I'm a designer. And I say, that's great. Um, what you do is absolutely magical. You're, you're really busy with deep insights. You're creating things of beauty. You're an artist that works within constraints. However, if you're not able to be open and understand the power that data brings to the table, you've already limited, you know, conceptually your career in the sense that there are, two, there are two things happening here. If we think about the debate that just happened at Cannes a couple weeks ago, a lot of the entries push that envelope of is it creative or is it technology? Where does digital and artistry, where does that continuum end and break? And what does that spectrum look like? So I really encourage my staff to be thinking at least understand the lingo of both sides, understand the power of both sides, so that you can switch hats depending on your audience, and you can make sure you bring the best of both to the table for a client. Now, one way we've been able to bridge this is to create a course that's specifically for our teams that is data for designers. And alternatively, for the people who work in Tableau and Excel, what is design for them? What's their vocabulary, what they understand? Let's introduce them to those two things so that those people can work together on a project and understand how they help each other. A really good practical example is um, we often have this debate in design projects. Do you do a bit of quant first? Do you do your qualitative research first and then back it up with survey results? How do those two things work? So we, we kicked off a project in a, f a former life about um, for people who go into hardship. So people who have mortgages and they're doing it tough and they all of a sudden can't make their mortgage payments. And the designers had said, maybe the quant guys can help us out with this. We work in a big bank. Maybe they have some transactional data. We're still going to do our job and we're still going to do the interviews and find out with these people who are in hardship what all the insights. But the quant team came up with something really interesting. They said, we have found one single universal fact with all the people going into hardship. The month before they go into hardship and can't make their loan payments, they all cancel Foxtel. That's the last want, you know, luxury item that they have, and they've all done it as the last thing that they had to, you know, scrape, and, you know, they couldn't pay anymore, that they canceled their pay TV, because that's one thing that's, you know, quite important for, uh, for, for people when they're, you know, at home in the evenings and on the weekends for entertainment. So they came to us and said, hey, if you want to look into the research insights from people, we can actually go through the transaction data, find these people, and then you can do your research for people who are just about to go into it. Um, and that's sort of your, your pool of people to do your research on, which was fantastic. And that was such a huge moment for the designers to say, all right, those guys have something worthwhile to bring to the table. Um, that's actually a really great insight. Um, so you, the two teams can actually work together for a really good uh, benefit. 
I often get this feedback as well from our design team saying, isn't it just data visualization? Isn't it just a way for people to consume the information? Um, and we push them with their thinking to say, actually, you're in that driver's seat. How can you create a service or a product that listens, that actually changes, that adapts? How are you going to create feature sets that dial up or down? How are you going to create interactions so people can have different pathways between your design? And lastly, how are you going to create a service that acts, something that will keep uh, that will that will make decisioning and that will change what it offers to people. So, as an example, um, some people want to opt out of a, pro, uh, a product. How do you make it easy to exit the product? Or they're saying this isn't working for me. How do you change them from one flow to the other? We quite often create the happy flows, or we create different versions of it. But how do you create more of those interactions um, so that the product can act on behalf of the user preferences? And it's about looking both ways. So. We say if you think you're on this continuum, you look at the data and understanding how it can support better experiences or it's being design-led. And we really like to show people you're on this, this crosswalk in between the two. And sometimes on a project, you're going to lean one way, and sometimes you're going to lean the other way. Um, but it is really that continuum of the, the two things, as uh, James mentioned earlier. Um, this really helps people drive home that we're actually all trying to reach the same thing. So if you speak to people who are data scientists, and I don't mean people who change their job title, but who are actually data scientists um, and have actually gone through the training to do that, they're looking in those data sor sources, they're creating the models, and then they're going to you know, service that in a user interface. Our designers come at the other, from the other side and say, all right, what does the user care about? What information do they want to see? And then they will say, we need to capture that information. So there's this really interesting moment at the user interface to see what do people care about and having that conversation with a data scientist to say, it's not just about what we have, but how do we service the information people care about? And it always leads to the question of, there's stuff people want to know that we don't capture today which is always a challenge for the organization to say, how are we going to make that interface the right information for what people actually want? So what does this mean for design? We talk about um, data and design three different ways. And, and Matt really wanted us to sort of talk about the detail of what do we need by data and design. So I'm going to spend a bit of time on this slide talking about how do we do it in different parts of the project and what phase and what does that mean? So the first one is probably sort of the first level of maturity, you know, designing with data. You have a lot of information trapped in uh, the databases of your clients, um, publicly available data, or what you can capture from design research. So you get that data, understand the data, and that usually provides a complex view of your user, of, of their profile. The second part is designing for data. This is really where you set up the tools you need in order to capture information. So this could be setting up sensors, physically or digitally. This could be setting up data partnerships for how you need to get data to bring it into the equation. And also then, how are you going to use it um, to create what we call a customer genome, which is basically how are you going to create that personalization for someone. And the last one is a bit about that living services uh, concept I was talking about. How do you then create it where it's dynamic? How do these things all come together in order to capture the information, understand the customer, but also have that adaptability in your, in your service? And the last element of it, which is kind of the holy grail, is how do people want to interact with you? You have a service that molds and shifts with them, but how do they want to interact with you? Do they want it to be a chat bot? Do they want to look through a screen? Do they want it to be voice? So that element of channel also comes into it. Um, a good example we did was for uh, Unilever in the UK for their HR department. And they wanted a chat bot for, um, for HR queries. Um, and we wanted to validate whether a chatbot was the right way. And so we said, do people call someone? Do they ask a friend? Do they go to the website? How are people, you know, what channels are they using today? And quite often we found out that they were texting other colleagues to find out, do you know how to do this? Do you know how to do that? Do you know who does this? So we said, all right, this actual, this mode of, of small text messages works really quite well. The element of that um, service that we created was for it to stay relevant, any queries um, and recalls of the information that stayed relevant um, were kept in the database. Anything that was not queried or surfaced as an answer for a question after six months was deleted. 
So that information was no longer relevant. It was actually taken out of the circulation for that chatbot. Only new queries were answered, new information was put forward, and anything that was relevant was actually kept in there as part of the service. So this just talks about which phases you're going to use it in. So using the data to understand the customers and the discovery phase. When you're going to start um, collecting the information, you're doing that in defining and describing what the designs are. And then by using that information to keep refining your product, to use it in the delivery phase. So I have time for a couple quick case studies. Um, I'm only going to talk about these to talk about how data was used. So the first one is sort of that first trash. Um, we had, uh, they say, Something like 87 Australians under the age of 25 each day start their first job at Woolies. So it's, it's all about hiring teenagers across Australia and giving them their first job. Um, they asked us to come in and talk about the recruitment and onboarding process for staff. And as you know, they have so many different locations that we needed to think about how are we going to choose which of the locations to go and interview. And we were really challenged by the client on you know, why did you pick these stores and not others? Or you always get that um, reply from clients like you only interviewed that many people, you know, as if it's such a small set and therefore cannot be statistically significant. So by being able to show them, we took your data from your stores, what those look like, and based on that, we chose these specific stores. They kind of were at ease that, okay, you did choose the right amount of stores and we understand why. And we had a really good story at what, what that looked like, so they were okay with that. But the other interesting thing with this is that the client had a hypothesis that the regional stores had really, really good high staff engagement stores because the managers were piloting some interesting programs from corporate, and that's why the staff were so happy. So we thought, all right, that's a hypothesis. We'll test it out. And in the qualitative research, we found out that the staff who worked at the regional stores were a lot happier because they didn't have to travel very far for work. They were able to work in stores that they already were familiar with, close to home, places they already frequented with shops and, and people they saw, and it was just close to home. Whereas in the metro stores, people often had to travel a lot farther for work. It was a lot more anonymous, not as personal, and it tacked on that extra travel time, so they were less happy had nothing to do with the management engagement programs at all. So we were actually able to save them a lot of money by saying, you don't have to invest in those programs. These other factors have nothing to do with why people are happy at one store versus another, which was quite interesting. That's a really basic example of, of using the data and how quantum qual can complement each other. Um, this next one is a case study that's a couple years old, but I think it's relevant. At the time this case was done is when the Apple iWatch came onto the scene, and it provided a way for you to capture information, but also to interact and provide more data for a service. And I picked this one because it's all about diabetes um, from our Stockholm studio from a colleague of ours named Jonas. So I'll just play this case study. It's a video that's just a couple minutes. My name is Jonas Höglund. I'm Service Design Director here at Fjord Stockholm. In 2007, at the age of five, my son Max was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Ever since, me and my wife had to have total control over Max to understand everything about Max's daily activities. Being a patient of a type 1 diabetes means that you don't have insulin in your body anymore, but instead you have to submit it. But to know how much insulin to submit, you need to know all the variables around you. What, what he's doing, what he's eating, how he's sleeping, and so on. Diabetes is a global epidemic. Today, there is 387 million people diagnosed with diabetes. And that number is expected to rise to 592 million people by the year 2030. That is more than 50% increase in less than 15 years. The yearly global cost related to diabetes is 612 billion US dollars. That means that in US, one out of every ninth dollar spent on healthcare is spent on diabetes. But it should not have to be like that. Today we're leaving all these digital footprints behind us. We're carrying around the phones with us, we have activity bands. All that data could be put to use to see patterns in the data. And we could do that on an individual level, but we could also do it on a community, on a group level. Fjord Fido will enable to predict 
from those patterns for the future. The system will provide insulin intake recommendations based on different parameters. The most important thing is to create sort of a system that will digest all that data and provide the most relevant data for the users, for them to be able to make the right decision at the right time. We started to find the right parameters or patterns that we want to use for the service. Once you know what problem you're trying to solve, you have to understand the context that that problem exists in and ask all the contextual questions that you need to answer in order to get an understanding of the context. For example, when uh, Max is taking the bike to school, and this is something that we predict throughout reoccurring patterns, we will get a better and more accurate prediction of the need for insulin intake, which is the main purpose of Fido. So for example, taking a breakfast scenario, the system could suggest that you would take less insulin than normal due to predicted activities, that you have a planned gym class that day, that you didn't sleep the way you usually sleep, or a prediction of you taking the bike to school. It's gonna have a huge impact on people's lives as a living service because it will adapt and change and not only improve one person's life with diabetes but include uh, improving the life of their families, their friends. Why we started this project is this would have an enormous impact on Max's life. The promise actually to give Max his life back and give him the control. As a company, there is great business potential in bringing this to the market. And not just for diabetes, but as a living service platform for better self-treatment. Cool, so as you can see, that's a bit of an older uh, case study, but it talks about the elements of in context. Um, it's not surfacing information that's just information for inference, you know, information's sake, just stats because they're nice, but it's really relevant things for Max in his day-to-day -day life. And it also has that element of sensing. He can input things, but it also has the accelerometer on it. It knows his sleep patterns. It's going to learn from, from those patterns. Uh, the next one, I'm actually just going to uh, talk through because I don't have uh, time to go through the case. This is a bit of a uh, fun one that uh, won several amount of awards at the Cannes Festival a couple weeks ago. Um, again, talking about what does AI and data mean for creativity's sake. It was a campaign that our um, Rothko, which is a, an Irish partner of ours, worked on for the Times. They said it was the centennial of when JFK was assassinated. So he was uh, assassinated in 63 and he was on his way to the trademark to make a speech. And what this project did is it went past and looked at all the 831 speeches he had previously given, went through and analyzed all of those phonetic patterns, cleansed it, you know, was able to, hello, sorry, my little son's at the back. Hey, buddy. Um, was able to see what those patterns look like and repackage all of those sounds for him to create. Uh, they created an artificial version of that speech actually given, being given for him. So it was a 20 minute speech. They had what he would have said. They took all those other speech patterns and then they recreated what he would have said over those 20 minutes. And they played it for the people who were there on the day he was assassinated at Trademark that found out that he wasn't able to make it. Now, the amount of traffic that generated from the Times was huge. Um, you know, the amount of hits it got and interactions from that. But what it really showed that case study is the amount of just hard work to go through all of the data, to find what is suitable, to do the analysis for it. Um, and the reason I like that case study is because of the impact that it's able to use not just on this sort of marketing and advertisement, you know, glossy application, but what it's being used for today is for ALS sufferers who are slowly degenerating and not able to use their voices. Um, they're able to interact with computers and get this really sort of computerized voice speak for them. It's using their old voices that have been recorded and it's able to then give them their voice again, which is a really heartwarming example of how you can use the, the data for that. Now, I don't think that that's the use of, of AI. I think that's just you know using the data and re, repackaging it and repurposing it for another reason. But thinking about the impact that data can have when we're thinking about it a bit more creatively of how we can apply it, I think is really, really worthwhile. So I'll just skip On the over. 20th? Yep, okay. Um, 
you can have a look at my LinkedIn, my, my background. Um, the only thing I want to say to the audience, and particularly for the people we met last night who say, I'm not currently in design or I may not be in the right place I want to be professionally, I would just say that the one thing that uh, has really guided me is the passion for what you're doing. When people realize you're excited about what you do, you're going to be good at it because your energy and your heart is in it. Um, you're there for the right reasons, and people will always see that. So you will get headhunted, you will get picked up, you will be able to create your own roles when people can tell this is something that you should be doing and you're guided by you know, that drive to, to move forward. So people have said, oh, you haven't gone to design school and you don't have a PhD and blah, blah, blah. I don't think it actually matters. I think if you're interested and you invest in these types of skills personally and, and go that extra mile, people will always recognize that and you always get asked to move to a role that today doesn't exist. So I don't know what that will be for the next step and what your next steps will be, but I think if you have that drive and resilience, you will get there. Um, I'm incredibly honored to work for Fjord. We're a team of 28 studios globally. We have 1,000 designers in, 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 a, in service at the moment, and we focus on these three things. So if you want to know any, any more about what we do or how we do that, um, come reach out to me afterwards. So thank you very much.